Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to this short introduction to the MAPS Air Museum located in Green, Ohio. As you are all aware, the current pandemic has caused changes in the way all of us do business, and MAPS is no different. In this video, I hope to give you a brief idea of what MAPS represents. While this is not the full museum tour, I hope it will interest you in a visit after all the restrictions are lifted. The first question that we often get from people is what is MAPS? If you are looking for a building full of old paper maps, you might be somewhat disappointed. MAPS stands for Military Aviation Preservation Society. We are located adjacent to the Akron Canton Regional Airport. The organization that has evolved into what today is MAPS started in 1990 with 14 members and a small section of a maintenance building that was part of the former Ohio National Guard facility. In this year, our 30th anniversary, we have a total of 721 memberships representing 1,105 members. Of those members, 262 members logged over 58,000 volunteer hours working in restoration, in the library, in the gift shop, serving as tour guides, designing displays as part of the curator staff, or working on gardens and groundkeeping. Starting with one airplane, we now have 53 aircraft in our collection and over 100 displays of uniforms and artifacts. Working with a limited budget, we do not spend much on advertising and depend on word of mouth for visibility and thus have become one of the best kept secrets in the area. The mission of the MAPS Air Museum as a not-for-profit organization is to educate people about the history of aviation and its impact upon modern society. We do that by acquiring, restoring, preserving, and exhibiting not only aircraft, but artifacts as well, while educating the public on the importance of history, not just aviation history, on the culture of man. At MAPS, the history of aviation is more than just airplanes. It is about those who have dreamed of flying, those who ultimately made those dreams a reality, and those that have experienced the freedom of flight. We preserve them, not for people just to look at aircraft. We preserve them to tell their stories, so that history is not forgotten. A central theme that serves as the foundation of everything we do was summed up by an American philosopher by the name of George Santana. In one of his works titled, The Life of Reason, he wrote, those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. That is a lesson that we still struggle with today. In this short introduction to maps, we're going to highlight four of the 53 aircraft in our collection three veterans of an all-too-quickly passing generation of members, and stories of four of the over 100 displays that you would see upon visiting the museum. The first aircraft that we will share with you is also the oldest in our collection, the 1909 Martin Glider. The glider was designed, built, and flown by William Martin. What makes this aircraft special to us is that Martin was a local farmer who owned a farm just northeast of Canton, Ohio. Martin, an aviation enthusiast throughout his life, started making models out of balsa wood and paper, eventually designing a mono-winged aircraft powered by two counter-rotating propellers. In 1908, Martin built a full-scale model of his aircraft. As he was unable to find funding to buy an aircraft engine or propellers, he had to find another method of moving the craft through the air to generate lift. William and his sons hauled the machine from the barn to the top of a hill on the back section of the farm on January 12, 1909. As the first flights were conducted during the winter, the aircraft rested on skis, not wheels. William climbed into its creation and waited as Billy, the family's farm horse, was hitched to the front of the plane by a long rope. When all was set, his son George whistled to Billy 
and the horse started down the hill at a fast clip. The aircraft's runners glided through the snow for a short distance until the craft lifted from the ground and gained an altitude of about 20 feet. As Billy slowed, the plane settled back to the ground. The first flight lasted about 200 feet. Martin's grandson, William H. Martin II, later joked that his grandfather had invented the first one-horsepower airplane. Martin's wife, Elmina, then took her seat in the aircraft and made several successful flights being the first American woman to fly a heavier than aircraft. Her longest flight traveled 300 feet and reached an altitude of 35 feet. In May of 1909, Mr. Martin demonstrated his plane successfully at Morris Park, New York. By this time, the ski runners had been replaced by three small wheels. During the exhibition, the aircraft was powered by an automobile donated by Henry Ford. The picture shows the car driven by Oral Parker with Mr. and Mrs. Martin as passengers. The pilot for this flight was former jockey George Thompson. The second aircraft in this introduction is the Martin B-26 Marauder Bomber, serial number 40-1459. The B-26 at the MAPS Air Museum, a World War II medium bomber, is one of only seven of these aircraft left in the world. The last mission flown by this airframe occurred on January 16, 1942. The flight was to have ended at Elmendorf Air Force Base in Alaska. This particular flight of three B-26s was planned due to intelligence developed from intercepts dealing with the pending Japanese operation to Midway. The intercepts indicated that deception operations were planned with Japanese forces landing in Dutch Harbor and the Aleutian Islands. After takeoff, the aircraft hit bad weather and strong headwinds in flight, which used up most of the fuel. As the aircraft could no longer reach Elmendorf, the crews needed to find a place to land. The only place available was a snow-covered dry lake bed near Smith River, British Columbia. All three aircraft successfully made wheels-up landings in the snow with only minor injuries to the crew. The crew was rescued on January 19th. In February of 1942, the Army Air Corps abandoned the aircraft in place and listed them as condemned. In April of 1942, an Army Air Force salvage team removed the engines, landing gear, radio equipment and weapons from the wrecks and marked the wings and fuselages with yellow painted X's. The aircraft remained in that location for almost 30 years, when in September of 1971, they were salvaged by members of the Military Aviation Restoration Corporation from Geno, California and placed in storage. In August 15, 1994, the salvage sections of 40-1459 arrived at MAPS. Over the next 26 years, one of the longest restoration efforts, the aircraft was restored for static display. The restoration effort required repairing what was repairable and then building any missing parts from scratch. The Grumman A4 Skyhawk Bureau number 139947 is an example of a Vietnam era light attack aircraft. MAPS was notified in late November of 2015 that an A4 aircraft was available at the Chanute Aerospace Museum in Illinois as the museum was soon to close. MAPS volunteers quickly assembled a transportation team and traveled to the museum. The aircraft was disassembled and trucked back to MAPS arriving on December 13, 2015. The first task in the restoration process was removing all the old paint on the airframe. In planning for restoration and the new paint scheme, it was discovered that a local pilot flew with the Navy's Blue Angels when they flew the A-4. A request was sent to the National Naval Aviation Museum in Pensacola, Florida for permission to paint the aircraft with the Blue Angel colors and markings. 
Once permission was received, one of the shortest and most intense restoration programs in MAPS history was accomplished so the airframe was ready for the 2016 Veterans Day program. The pilot to whom the aircraft was dedicated was Stuart Robinson Powery. Powery was a 1966 graduate of Firestone High School in Akron, Ohio. He received an appointment to the United States Naval Academy at Annapolis, Maryland. Flight school followed graduation from the academy and he earned his wings in 1972. Following eight years of flying assignments, he applied for a position on the Naval's flight demonstration team, the Blue Angels, and was accepted in 1980. He flew that season as the opposing solo for Aircraft 6. As the 1982 season approached, Powery and the rest of the team began their training. But on February 22, 1982, during a maneuver known as the Dirty Loop, his A-4 Skyhawk crashed to the ground and he was killed, leaving behind a wife and two young children. On November 5, 2016, the MAPS A-4 was dedicated to Lieutenant Commander Stuart Powery. In addition to the 450 guests in attendance of the ceremony were Powery's widow, her two children, three grandchildren, and four former Blue Angel aviators that flew with him. The final aircraft that we will introduce you to is one that is often overlooked by visitors and one that has links to people most have heard about. Smaller than a full-size aircraft with a wingspan of slightly over 12 feet, the OQ-2A was developed during World War II as an aerial target for anti-aircraft gunnery practice, making it one of the first drone aircraft. The OQ-2A was built by the Radio Plane Company located at the Van Nuys Airport in the Los Angeles metropolitan area. Those that are students of history would remember that the training films made during the war were produced by the War Department through a special organization called the Army Air Force's First Motion Picture Unit, which was located in Hollywood. This organization was also part of the publication effort of Yank Magazine, the soldier's magazine during the war. In the summer of 1945, Captain Ronald Reagan of the U.S. Army's First Motion Picture Unit ordered a private, previously trained as a professional photographer, on a routine assignment for Yank Magazine. David Conover, then 26, headed to Southern California's Radio Plane Corporation factory. His job was to shoot morale-boosting photographs of pretty girls doing their job to help the war effort. As Conover later wrote, quote, I moved down the assembly line, taking shots of the most attractive employees. None was especially out of the ordinary. I came to a pretty girl putting on propellers and raised the camera to my eye. She had curly red hair and her face was smudged with dirt. I snapped her picture and then walked on. Then I stopped, stunned. She was beautiful. I retraced my steps and introduced myself. He then asked for her name. The girl smiled, offered me her hand and said, I'm Norma Jean Dougherty. Young Norma Jean quickly found success as a model after the war. In 1952, she once again came to the attention of the public, this time with a different hair color and a different name, Marilyn Monroe. When we talk about maps, we talk about people, not just airplanes. Some of these individuals have been honored at the museum through displays, aircraft, dedications, and other remembrances. There is another group, however, that should also be recognized. The volunteers that work at MAPS are actually those who make history take flight. Most are retirees, a majority are former military or family members. They represent all services, Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force, and Coast Guard. They represent all ranks from enlisted to general. You might be greeted in the gift shop by a former army captain who flew in Vietnam. Your tour guide might be a former Green Beret soldier. 
a Vietnam era helicopter pilot, or a fighter pilot who was on alert in Florida at the beginning of the Cuban Missile Crisis. You might run across a combat medic who served in Vietnam, or an Air Force Brigadier General who flew the F-84 that is in our collection. Their stories also represent what MAP stands for. There are three, however, that have been special to this organization for some time now. Three that represent the greatest generation, a group that is rapidly disappearing. They are heroes to the membership at MAPS. Captain Donald Block of Canton, Ohio was one of the youngest command pilots in the European theater during World War II. Don flew a total of 60 combat missions during the war in the Martin B-26 Marauder Bomber. Although born in Massachusetts, Lieutenant Robert Withy lived most of his life in Jackson Township. In World War II, Bob was a fighter pilot stationed in the Pacific, flying both the P-40 Warhawk and the P-51 Mustang. The full-scale replica of a P-51 Mustang located at the end of the road leading to maps was dedicated to Bob in 2015. Lieutenant Ralph Lynn Jr. lived in Maslin, Ohio. Ralph served in the European Theater of Operations during World War II as a co-pilot of a B-24 Liberator bomber. Ralph flew 33 missions over occupied Europe during the war. Within our two display rooms, as well as throughout the museum itself, are over 100 displays, each one honoring men and women from the state of Ohio who served in past conflicts or who supported those who served. Artifacts from the War of 1812 through the present day are preserved at the Maps Air Museum. The following are just samples of the stories that have been preserved. Most are familiar with what happened on December 7, 1941. Our Pearl Harbor display honors the bravery and sacrifice of those that served. Central to that history is one ship, the USS Arizona. Of the 2,403 casualties suffered during the attack on the Hawaiian Islands that morning, 1,177 of those died on the Arizona. Damaged beyond repair, the hull of the USS Arizona still lies in the calm waters of Pearl Harbor as a national park and also as a national cemetery for those who perished on that ship. The Arizona's hull is spanned by a memorial to those who died. In a position of honor in the Pearl Harbor display at the Maps Air Museum is a piece of the superstructure of the battleship USS Arizona. William Bud Wentz enlisted in the U.S. Army Air Force in 1942. After completing pilot training and receiving his commission, he was assigned to the 8th Air Force where he piloted the B-17 Flying Fortress. His last mission occurred on April 7, 1945 and was chronicled by the History Channel in the show Dogfights. He was on the way to the target when, quote, I just felt this great big wump, and the airplane swayed back and forth, and there was a lot of metallic noise in the back, end quote. His aircraft had been rammed by a German fighter, flown by a wounded 17-year-old pilot. The effort was part of a last desperate bid by the German Luftwaffe in the waning months of World War II to bring down American bombers by any means possible. The collision had torn the rudder and both elevators off the tail of the B-17. Wentz said that after the fighter hit the tail of his B-17, he went through a familiar routine. Drop out of formations, jettison his bombs, tell the crew to down their parachutes, and look for a place to land the crippled aircraft. Fortunately, he found one. The last one he'd ever need, as it turned out. Wentz recalled that following the ill-fated flight, his commanding officer told him that after 28 missions and two forced landings, 
that the luck of the crew seemed to be wearing thin, so he was sending them home. The crew was very happy to hear the news, and as Wentz later said, quote, I felt at age 20 that I had already had a career, end quote. He got back to the United States the day Japan surrendered, ending World War II. Bud was honorably discharged with the rank of captain, and he was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross, among other citations. In 1966, he accepted an offer to return to Western Reserve School of Medicine and University Hospitals, where he had received his MD after the war. William Bud Wentz, MD, died peacefully on January 10, 2015, at the age of 90. Part of the display honoring Wentz is two small twisted pieces of metal. Parts of the FW-109 fighter that were lodged in the tail of his aircraft. Born in Zanesville, Ohio, Sharon Ann Lane was a 1961 graduate of Canton South High School. She attended the Altman School of Nursing in Canton, graduating in 1965. She worked at the Altman Hospital as a general duty nurse for 26 months. She then attended the Canton Business College for two years before deciding to join the U.S. Army Nurse Corps on April 18, 1968. Sharon arrived in Vietnam on April 29, 1969 and was assigned to the 312th Evacuation Hospital in Chu Lai. On June 8, 1969, First Lieutenant Sharon Lane was killed by enemy rocket fire while on duty at the hospital, becoming the first and only female combat casualty of the war. A statue to Lane was dedicated in front of the Altman Hospital, built with funds raised in the community. Within the hospital are the Sharon Lane Health Center and the Sharon Lane Women's Center. The Sharon Lane Volunteer Center was dedicated at Fort Hood, Texas, and the Evans U.S. Army Hospital in Fort Carson, Colorado, dedicated the Sharon A. Lane Medical Library in her honor. Joseph G. LaPointe, Jr. was born in North Dayton, Ohio on July 2, 1948, and graduated from Northridge High School in May of 1966. In early 1968, he received his draft notice and reported for duty on May 8, 1968. As LaPointe indicated that he was a conscientious objector, he was trained as a medic. He was married during the summer of 1968 and was sent to Vietnam in November of that year. On April 12, 1969, he was awarded the Silver Star for risking his life under fire, treating 17 casualties during a combat operation. On June 2, 1969, Specialist LaPointe was participating in a combat helicopter assault with the 101st Airborne Division when his platoon came under enemy automatic weapons fire, resulting in a number of wounded. Specialist LaPointe again ran forward through enemy fire to treat the wounded, at one point shielding one with his own body. Despite being wounded, he continued his life-saving duties until he was mortally wounded by an exploding enemy grenade. In January of 1972, for his heroism under fire, Specialist 4th Class Joseph G. LaPointe, Jr. was posthumously awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. A housing and medical complex in Fort Campbell, Kentucky, a medical heliport at Fort Benning, Georgia, and an Army Reserve Center in Riverside, Ohio, were named in his honor, as well of a portion of Ohio State Route 49 in Montgomery, Ohio. I hope that you have enjoyed this abbreviated tour of the Maps Air Museum and some of the aircraft and displays that are preserved here. Additional video presentations on some of the other aircraft, as well as interviews with veterans and other information are available on the MAPS website. We will continue to post updates as to hours and days of operation, as well as upcoming events at MAPS as they are finalized. Thank you for participating in this virtual tour 
of the MAPS Air Museum.